When Deputy Inspector Cyril Karn called up Sergeant Linus Mosk in the middle of the night and rushed him excitedly into a discreet corner of the security control room because he didn't technically have authority to start the operation he was about to start. But anyway, he gives Sergeant Mosk some great news. He's found a suspect for the recent murder of two pre-arms for Alana sentries and now he wants to plan a raid. So one suspect. How many men do you think we need? I'll say 12, sir. I had assumed that this line was just the apex of the silly crescendo that was building in the scene. An over-the-top response by two overly ambitious men. After all, there's a stark difference between them and the rest of the employees at the pre ox Morlana Authority, including the chief inspector himself, who really didn't seem to care much about this case at all. And now what? Sergeant Tactical Blueberry is calling for a full squad of Corpo Tactical Troops, 12 men to capture one scrawny male from Canari? It seemed like overkill, but... Of course, everyone at corporate headquarters, including a lot of us viewers, including myself, we were all wrong. The situation that Karn and Moss would enter would be far more complicated and dangerous than just a simple house call by a few detectives. They were entering into a hostile territory, a war zone. Now, Star Wars often doesn't do a good job at portraying the point of view of the baddies, but Andor is definitely changing things a bit. No longer are we just told directly who is good and who is bad. Things are a bit muddled and confusing, just like how it is in real life. And it's really up to the viewer to come up with their own interpretations of the event. And so in that spirit today, I want to put ourselves in the shoes of the Priox Morlana Authority Enforcement Team that not only caused a disastrous incident, which led to loss of life, but actually led to the complete collapse of the Priox Morlana's authority over the free sector territories. Ferrex and several other worlds in the free sector fell under the jurisdiction of the Priox Morlana Corporation, which controlled the region sort of like how the East India Company controlled India from the 18th and 19th century. And so as the local authority, Priox Morlana had security forces, but due to holdover regulation from the Galactic Republic period and further limitations imposed by the Galactic Empire, these security forces were designed primarily for internal policing and not conventional warfare. Translation, they didn't have like Star Destroyers and tanks and other heavy weapons. That would have been probably forbidden. And so these corporate tactical forces are going to be quite similar in makeup to other police tactical units that you might be familiar with. This means their equipment training and mindset will be drastically different from military infantry units. Just because they look like Space Marines doesn't mean that they're going to be going around creating havoc. Police tactical units are designed for preventing death and not causing it, and primarily but not exclusively trained for operations in more built-up urban areas of the galaxy. The goal here is to limit collateral damage and civilian casualties, so while they will be heavily armored against small arms fire, their offensive firepower will be limited to blasters and non-lethal munitions. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at it, each one of the teams that gets deployed only has like one or two rifles. Most of these guys are using their sidearms. There definitely are no heavy support weapons, no explosives, uh, and their vehicles are used for transport, not to mount gigantic weapons on. Police tactical units are also designed to engage in operations lasting no longer than a few hours or a day at most. At the end of the day, if all goes well, they get to return home. And so they're not carrying with them rations and sleeping gear and, uh, you know, a combat load of ammunition. And so the Priox Marlana are trained for more limited and controlled types of engagements. Let's say you have a bank robber who's holed up in a bank and already surrounded by police officers, you call these guys in. Or if you have some kind of executive who's disgruntled and he's holding his secretary hostage, you call these guys in. Now, judging by the reaction of salvage workers on Ferrex when they first see the Priox Marlana enforcement team. I haven't seen any blues in a while. What the hell are they doing? It's clear that this corporate authority has almost zero presence on this planet. There's no local law enforcement or garrison here that could support this type of operation. And if there is, there's no indication that Cyril Karn coordinated with the local enforcement at all. And so these guys just went in without any backup. It's clear when assessing both Cyril Karn and Linus Moss that these two individuals were very zealous and probably very loyal to the cause, but they lacked the proper time to actually gather enough information that one needs to carry out a proper raid. Generally, raids like this into an unknown area with unknown amounts of combatants involved in the situation, you need a few days, if not weeks, to really plan out things and do reconnaissance so you know what you're getting yourself into. And instead, Cyril Karn and Linus Moss have gathered their assault team just hours later the next morning, and they're briefing everyone on their way to the raid. The plan is pretty simple. One team will execute the warrant, while two other teams will provide perimeter support. Sergeant Moss gives very little intel about the location, aside from a snide remark about the locals. 
There may be some local residents who are less than enthused with our presence. Now, it's possible that worlds like Ferrex are considered generally stable, and there are no significant criminal or insurgent groups on the world. From what we've seen of Ferrex, it represents a frontier town of sort with a strong social fabric and acceptable quality of life. This seems to limit violent crime to a certain extent, but the local law enforcement presence on this planet is limited, if not completely absent. Now, it's possible that the Galactic Empire did have tougher uh, restrictions on, you know, personal firearms, blasters, and stuff like that, which would make the corporate tactical enforcement team feel a lot safer when going to this type of planet. Maybe the corporate uh, authority themselves have more restrictive laws about firearms, who knows? But judging by the fact that Sergeant Mosk only is bringing 12 individuals on this raid, he's assuming that either the locals are completely harmless and unarmed or that they respect the authority of Priox Merlana. Either way, he's very confident about the situation and the men seem confident, if not bored. They're definitely not scared. The tack pods used by the corporate authorities are small enough to be terrifying to ride down from orbit. The vessel shakes and rattles, and an uncomfortable silence amongst the men only accentuates the sound of the stress that re-entry has on the space frame of the ship. But from the look on everyone's face, well, everyone aside from the deputy inspector, this seems like just another boring day on the job. There is no real tension as the tactical enforcement unit disembarks from their tack pods. They don't even have their weapons drawn. They're not really expecting resistance. As West team executes the warrant, East and North team are casually standing by in support. By all means, this seems like a normal policing action, not a military action, which is good. Good for them. Look at the casual way East team is standing. They might as well be pulling security at an Empire Day parade or something like that. The atmosphere changes, however, when West team enters the home of Marva Andor and begins turning her place over and questioning her. They're aggressive, but not excessive. No one's smacking the old lady in the face or anything like that, but a crowd begins to gather outside of Marva's home and they're getting curious and slightly angry. Sergeant Mosk is able to triangulate the location of Cassian Andor when he unknowingly contacts Marva's droid while the tactical enforcement team is in his home. This changes the location of their operation to another part of the city. But the unrest outside of the house is beginning to grow. Now, Deputy Inspector Karn, or rather Sergeant Linus Mosk, who's actually the individual in charge during the ground operation phase, could have made an assessment here to pull back and perhaps call in reinforcements. But of course, that's not the kind of guy he is. It's unfortunate that Cyril Karn is so inexperienced because he's clearly smarter than Sergeant Mosk and he should be in command here because the sergeant makes a crucial mistake by abandoning those tack pods. At least one of them should be providing overwatch and another one should be ferrying them around the city so they don't have to walk everywhere. They're losing their mobility advantage. And the West team will slowly proceed on foot to the new location where Andor is, which is 10 minutes away. As they're walking, we see the city slowly evolving. Whereas before the security team was more or less either ignored or um, curiously looked at by bystanders, now it seemed like the city was coming to life, almost like a body's immune system kicking into gear and preparing itself to get rid of some foreign invaders. West team and the rest of the corpos are beginning to feel the heat a bit more. But to their credit, no one is stupid enough to point their weapons at the civvies or start any physical confrontation. Their goal instead is to reach their targets. Soon, all around the city of Ferrex, citizens begin hitting small ornaments that adorn the doorways of their humble houses. This is the Ferrex version of lighting the beacons, I guess. Sergeant Moss chooses to ignore this. Uh, the situation on the ground is rapidly changing. What is all this? Intimidation, sir. Bluff and bluster. Cyril Karn, who again is a lot more observative than the sergeant, notices that something is off. They should at least understand that their cover is blown here. And only Sergeant Moss is unfazed by this situation. North team, which has been left maintaining a perimeter for an objective that now has moved, ends up detaining a random individual they see running away from them. It's Bix, and she's on her way to help warn Andor. But North Team doesn't know this. There's no real reason for them to be detaining people. With the situation quickly spiraling out of control all around them, their focus should be keeping aware of their surroundings and not detaining more people that they'll have to watch. And honestly, Sergeant Mosh should have been coalescing his forces so that they're not too spread out. Because the more spread out the corpos are, the more outnumbered they are, and the more outnumbered they are, the more scared they are. And these guys don't seem to be the best trained or disciplined officers. From what I can tell by Chief Inspector Hines' demeanor and his willingness to sweep the issue of the murdered employees beneath the rug, I feel like not much care is given towards the employees of the corporate authority. 
Sure, they're given the tools and equipment to make themselves look like badass security forces, but we know that's just a small portion of the overall budget that goes into sustaining a security force. Far more important is the actual quality of the people you're you know, hiring, so salary matters, and the second thing would be training. How many times a year do these guys get put into situational training, go over tactics and theory? How many times do they go to the range and fire their blasters? How qualified are these individuals and where are they getting recruited from? Judging by how one of the members of North Team acts when good old Tim shows up and bull rushes at them, I'm guessing they're not given that much training at all. Tim is completely unarmed and look at that doofy face, he does not look that dangerous. A stun round here would have been sufficient and if they don't have access to those type of non-lethal weapons then a rifle butt to the face is fine. Worst case scenario, shoot them in the lower extremities. Look, I don't think this guy is a born killer or even has bad intent here. He's clearly scared and the tension of the situation around him is getting to him. The team leader actually disarms him and then sends him off to retrieve their extraction vehicle. Which is strike number two for him. The reason the shooting even happened is because they ended up detaining Bix for no reason. And now he sends a clearly shook member of his team all by himself to retrieve a vehicle in a hostile city without his rifle. All he has is a sidearm now. That individual ends up being so nervous that when he finds out that his tactical pod has been secured to a piece of salvage instead of calmly trying to extract himself from the situation, he ends up pushing the ship too far and crashes their ride out of there. This is because the team leader in this situation is not leading. He's trying to dispose of a problem that he doesn't really want to deal with. This is a sign of really bad company culture. Meanwhile, East Team has surrounded the entrance to the building in which Andor is meeting Luth and Rael. They're smart enough to wait for the rest of the unit to arrive before proceeding to serve the warrant. These guys are completely unprepared for Luth and Rael. He is not your usual type of perp. I mean, the guy's got enough explosives in his pockets to breach a planetary shield. And the members of the East Team make a bit too much noise and they are detected and blown up as a result which immediately takes out at least one of their team members. To their credit, the ones who survived the initial explosion immediately begin engaging the two criminals. At least they're not afraid of combat. Although they were instructed to just keep them pinned down long enough so that reinforcements could arrive. Now these two corpos on the ground make the mistake of bunching up instead of spreading out and they're quickly outflanked and taken out. One of the officers climbs up on top of the rafters and he does a good job and manages to get a shot on target before Andor and Luthen Rael escape. Sergeant Lyons Moss has lost contact by this point with the East Team. He instructs North Team to head back and get the TAC pod into the air. They're not sure where Andor and the other suspects are now, so he wants to use this vehicle as a spotter. Now, nothing against a sergeant like Linus Moss, but he's way too reactive here. He's always one step behind the enemy's uh, actions. He should have placed that overwatch way before the mission even started. Maybe he's just not used to carrying out larger operations like this. The lone survivor of East Team reports that Andor and the second suspect are now on the run and approaching West Team. And so West Team sets up an ambush for him on the main thoroughway for the city. The ambush they set up is a bit strange though. They have guys on both sides of the road creating a dangerous potential for friendly fire later on. They've also split up completely and not into teams of two. Um, Deputy Inspector Karn should not be by himself or probably be wielding a blaster. They should have given him a tiny wooden gun. Alan, someone's nice enough to put a linseed oil in it. I mean, look at how he secures this building. Pistol held out, fully extended through the doorway like he's some Western action hero instead of holding his firearm firmly with two hands and keeping it tight to his chest so that he can easily maintain his weapon if anyone tries to jump out and grab his weapon from inside that dark room. He also pauses in the doorway, letting his body silhouette the open gap, a perfect target for a hidden gunman. Then he just opens fire the second two random civilians who are unlucky enough to be in the room trying to escape. Clearly he's on edge, he has no training for this type of situation. Now I know this sounds overly nitpicky, it's Star Wars, but this isn't normal Star Wars where you have soldiers running at each other with rifles in the open and firing at point blank range. This is Andor, the successor of Rogue One, which famously put its actors through boot camp to make sure that every little detail, including how the soldiers moved and looked, at least was believable. Tony Gilroy did the Bourne series, so I'm pretty sure he's gonna be focused on these little details, like how Cyril Karn clears the room. Cyril also seems to have forgotten to lock the back door, and he gets a blaster to the back of his head shortly after, and he quickly reveals how many men he has beneath his command. With that knowledge, Luthan Royale and Andor create a speeder bomb distraction, and it does exactly what it's meant to do, and they escape unscathed. 
Now, yes, these two good guys definitely have some degree of plot armor in this uh, firefight and or going after the Star Path unit was pretty dumb. But the Corpos, in all fairness, were completely unprepared for this battle. I mean, North Team is lucky that no one witnessed one of their guys blast a civilian for no reason. The citizens of Farrakhs might not be armed, but they got numbers and they could have overwhelmed them very easily. At the end of the day, Chief Inspector Hines, once again, is redeemed. I mean, I think he understood how ill-prepared his men were. Sure, his apathy about the state of the corporate security is definitely a huge issue, but maybe the corporation just didn't have enough of a budget to arm a properly equipped security force. Or perhaps what's even more likely is the fact that just like the Galactic Empire, at the local level, Priyanx Morlana just did not have enough resources to watch over all of their territory. So there you have it, guys. That is our breakdown of the operation on Ferrix. In the larger Star Wars franchise, this is one of the more insignificant battles, I think, out there. I mean, it's so small scale when compared to things like, you know, Geonosis and Andor, but once again, Andor delivers uh, through quality and uh, quantity, which really makes it worth it for a guy like me to kind of sit down and analyze each one of these scenes. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and if you did, give us a subscribe, hit that notification button down below, so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.